So we're not going to deep dive too much in the anatomy uh, physiology aspect. We'll get a bit of an understanding as to, to what makes the shoulder work, uh, work or tick so that you guys have a, a better understanding of those applications down the track. So a few of you might have a, a pretty good understanding, come from a, a health background. Others might be the first time talking about these joints. Um, your, your shoulder is basically a ball and socket joint. It's got a huge range of motion. Um, and it's a joint that we'd like to say is functionally stable. So what that means is basically the shoulder by itself doesn't have a lot of stability, um, has a lot of movement. Um, that's then uh, resulted in, in a bit of a lack of stability structurally compared to say the hip joint that's quite uh, deep into the, the socket um, or the ankle joint that's quite structurally stable there as well. So basically the, the shoulder doesn't just comprise that ball and socket, but actually the four joints that kind of help influence the shoulder are your glenohumeral joint, uh, your acromioclavicular joint, um, your sternoclavicular joint, and your scapulothoracic joint. So the acromioclavicular and the sternoclavicular are, don't really do much in the way of movement. They're more ligament-based um, joints, whereas the glenohumeral and scapulothoracic joint um, are the ones that end up influencing movement a lot. Okay, so the, what stabilizes the shoulder after that? Uh, the, the main players here we're looking at are the uh, rotator cuff muscles. So these rotator cuff muscles, uh, it, I think it's uh, pretty well known that you've got rotator cuff muscles, but what's often not known is that there's four muscles that comprise the rotator cuff group. Um, and they've got like a unified function. So they, they might have their own actions, like the supraspinatus spinatus helps to abduct the shoulder and keep it quite tight to the joint. So keep the, the shoulder in place. Um, we've got the infraspinatus and the uh, teres minor that help to uh, externally rotate the shoulder. And then the subscapularis that helps to internally rotate the shoulder. So those are all the different actions they have, but their unified uh, function is basically uh, to stabilize that shoulder or keep it close um, to the joint rather than thinking of them as just muscles that do actions there as well. So if anyone's been to the gym uh, and seen this exercise or has done this exercise before um, and thought they were working their rotator cuff muscles, I can tell you uh, that you're not doing that at all. You're basically doing an isometric bicep curl and squeezing your shoulder blades together. So when we look at those rotator cuff muscles, they obviously work in the different planes with their rotation um, and also the flexion. What we're doing here is basically just holding a dumbbell and then swinging our arms out. So we're going to kind of break down some of these uh, misconceptions when it comes to working the rotator cuff muscles to, to ensure that we're working the shoulder the way that we should be. Okay, so when we look at uh, that rotator cuff muscle group just a little bit more um, with action versus function, uh we don't really want to look at improving the rotator cuff muscle strength solely so if we're looking at just loading the rotator cuff muscle group by grabbing a band a cable um, externally rotating or internally rotating with that load we're kind of loading the action of the rotator cuffs rather than uh challenging the function of the rotator cuff muscles so this is beneficial um to load the action um kind of post-surgery um if you're and a, an older client uh, coming in, um, adding a little bit of strength into those movements. Um, or if you're new to like strength uh, and conditioning, so say like a young athlete or someone that hasn't been in the, the, the strength and conditioning realm um, in the way of a, a gym or loading tissue uh, previously. And there is a bit of a crossover in regards to how that strength then improves the stability um, of the shoulder. However, that has a bit of a limited ceiling. So you're not going to uh, keep improving the function of those rotator cuff muscles by just getting them stronger there as well. Um, and obviously, when we look at that shoulder joint, if we're, if I can get up a little bit so you can see me there, if we're looking at challenging it through its action and keeping it really close to the body, we're not really challenging its function in the way of stability. Having that elbow um, or the shoulder further away from the body allows for less stability and a little bit more challenge in regards to your, your uh, uh, rotator cuff stability or shoulder stability um, and the actions of those rotator cuff muscles there as well. Alrighty. So the scapula thoracic joints, we're going to break down that guy uh, or that joint a little bit more now. Now scapula thoracic joint or um, for instance, looking at this glenohumeral or scapulohumeral rhythm uh, is an interesting one to talk about because unlike the uh, ball and socket joint, 
there's not really anything uh in the outside world or the laws that exist in the outside world that can help kind of describe the way that that scapular thoracic joint works so we'll go into a, a little bit of it but for the most part that your scapula um wants to try and stay close to your thoracic spinal rib cage to help support uh, and stabilize the shoulder through a lot of its functions um, and if we look at the actual shoulder movement of flexion uh, you can see in that picture there on the side that we've got if we went for 180 degrees of flexion in your shoulder you'll find that 120 comes from the action of your glenohumeral joint so what we'd see there's that ball and socket joint and the last 60 happens to come from the scapular humeral um humeral rhythm so basically the the scapula moving with the humerus there it's not the last 60 it's basically like every one third is two thirds in, in relation to the ratio so it's not that you go just solely in one and then all, in, all the way through the other it kind of helps as it goes through um and uh it gives us a bit of an idea of how we need to address all the joints um that have functions within the shoulder um but to actually improve the, the shoulder overall performance so we can't just solely look at say the rotator cuff muscles or specifically at the glenohumeral joint and the actions that work there we also need to make sure that we're addressing everything that uh comprises around that scapular thoracic joint um as well as the other joints that kind of influence um the shoulder there so the other one that we didn't really talk about from a joint perspective because it's more just uh, comprises a section of your anatomy there is your thoracic spine there as well so your thoracic spine has a a, uh, a bit of an influence on the shoulder and how it moves um, and whether it's going to have limitations in its movement so if we've got stiffness or ad um, maybe adaptations or asymmetries in our, our thoracic spine uh, then we're going to have issues with how we move our shoulder there as well so just to give you a bit of an idea of how the the kind of scapular uh, humeral rhythm would work uh, that some of you guys might have come across this in your visits to physiotherapists or trainers in the past there but basically <coughs> these movements that we've got in the shoulder so the flexion extension abduction adduction this internal rotation external rotation is what's happening at this joint at a scapular thoracic this elevation depression retraction protraction pretty well known movements um i'd say for most folks uh around the shoulder blade these are movements that help support general demands that the shoulder um are acquiring from it the other two that uh happen to i guess work a lot is this upward rotation and downward rotation so this upward rotation is to show you this ne next slide here is this <clears throat> uh picture on the far left here so what's happening here is uh, uh what we were talking about in relation to this 60 degrees of scapular movement that can assist with that shoulder flexion you've got three muscles trying to pull the shoulder blade in this upward rotation movement that allows for more space to happen uh to open up in that uh glenohumeral joint to allow the shoulder to come up above the head so if we wanted to look at that and see what might work well in the movement compared to what might work uh or what is not working poor, um so well we can look at this video here so <laughs> in this video here play it a couple of times you want to see too much going on with it here on the left side we've got some good upward rotation of the scapula um you can see the scapula getting out of the way as the shoulder raises up above head height um, and we got that good upward rotation as the shoulder comes up on the right hand side here let's see if we can get it going again you're going to see less of that upward rotation there so limitation in this upward rotation on the right hand side it's going to be restricting the amount of movement or restricting the movement that he has uh, in his right hand shoulder so we're breaking down some of the movements of the the uh, the shoulder joint there okay one thing that i'll bring up a bit like that external rotation is the shoulders back and down <laughs> so shoulders back and down i think we get uh into the uh routine of using quite a lot as 
trainers or as therapists as an easy kind of approach to addressing this rounding of the shoulders that goes forward. And what we need to do um, with that shoulders back and down is just a, a simple change in posture that opens everything up. <laughs> now, the problem with the shoulders back and down is that we're trying to address probably postural issues that have more complex um, reasons for being the way they are, rather than just needing a straightforward shoulders back and down. But the second thing uh, that becomes a problem with that is if you've got your shoulders back and down and try to do anything, like if you had a boxer, for instance, had the shoulders back and down, they're going to be punching like a T-Rex and they're not going to be able to get their arms for moving anywhere. If you're doing that in uh, any movements that you're trying to make through life, you're kind of restricting the amount of movement through your shoulder blades because you've pinned your shoulders back and not allowing them to kind of move through all their ranges to support the shoulder through its different positions when you were... Uh, require the shoulder to be in different positions one of those key players is this uh, serratus anterior so <clears throat> we kind of brushed over some of the key players of stabilizers being the rotator cuff muscles um uh, looked at some of the scapular humeral rhythm that helps with that stability so supporting the the shoulder joint um, another big key player in there is his serratus anterior and this is a guy that helps your shoulder blades stick nice and tight to your rib cage so kind of avoids that winging movement that can often happen in the shoulder blades and if you're doing a shoulders back and down movement or shoulders back movement you're really contracting the uh, rhomboids which is muscles in your uh, mid back there that oppose the movement of serratus anterior there so if the serratus anterior help us go into this upward rotation for instance and we've pulled our shoulders back we can't then use our serratus anterior to support that shoulder uh with the the movement of upward rotation it'd be similar to this reciprocal in a uh, inhibition would be similar to like trying to touch your shoulder with the uh with one hand so you've tensed your bicep and then said all right i want you to really tense your tricep now and you've kind of inhibited your ability to tense your tricep because you've squished your bicep into full contraction you've not allowed the bite the, the tricep to extend so it's a body's way of uh stopping that co-contraction there Okay, so that was a bit of a kind of shotgun look at your shoulder and the, the key uh, joints, the key structures that support um, the shoulder stability and, and some of the, the, the key joints that allow us to move the, uh, the shoulder at a, in a functional or higher performing or in, with higher performance. 